Let's take a look at the spy plane the CIA once had built, the A-12 ox cart. The Lockheed A-12 ox cart was a single-seat Mach 3 Plus high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft built by the infamous Skunk Works for the Central Intelligence Agency. Based on the designs of Kelly Johnson, the A-12 flew from 1963 to 1968 and was the first in a family of super spy planes. Despite its short service life, the A-12 introduced revolutionary concepts in both aviation and manufacturing and still holds the unofficial world record for the fastest and highest air-breathing aircraft ever to fly, Mach 3.29 at 90,000 feet. The official record belongs to the later and heavier version of the A-12, the two-seat SR-71. Today, we will take a look at the development and operational history of this legendary aircraft. Additionally, the pressure suits worn by the pilots will be covered in a separate video which can be found over at Uniform History. I'll leave a link in the description below and at the end of the video. The A-12 began development after the existing spy plane in service, the U-2, was consistently being tracked and targeted by Soviet radars. In an effort that became known as Project Rainbow, modifications were made to reduce the radar cross-section or RCS of the U-2, but those efforts did not lead to any success. In fact, the Project Rainbow modifications cost the U-2 20% of its range and 5,000 feet of altitude, during a time when the best defense against Soviet surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, was extreme altitude, the CAA soon realized that a replacement for the U-2 was needed. By 1957, Project Gusto was initiated, and what followed were some fascinating design submissions from both Convair and Lockheed for a new spy plane. Convair had proposed modifying its supersonic B-58 Hustler bomber, which was designed to fly with a large centerline external payload. The new variant would be known as the B-58B Super Hustler and carry a parasite aircraft on its centerline. The idea was that the B-58B would accelerate to Mach 2, where the parasite aircraft's RJ-59 ramjet engines could be lit. The parasite aircraft would then be launched at an altitude of 35,000 feet and about 2,300 nautical miles from the intended target. And by using its ramjets, a speed of Mach 4 and altitudes of 90,000 feet would be obtained. After a dash over the target area, two conventional JT-12 turbojets would be used to fly the aircraft to a friendly base. After several design iterations, the parasite aircraft became known as the first invisible super hustler, or FISH. The B-58B and FISH combination were seen as too risky to provide funding, and the team at Convair had to come up with another design. Meanwhile, the Lockheed Skunk Works team led by Kelly Johnson were working on their own series of designs nicknamed Archangel, a name chosen since the U-2 program had been known internally by Lockheed as Angel. The Archangel designs were successively numbered A-1, A-2, and so on. By the time design A-11 had been reached, the aircraft was to have a speed of Mach 3.2, attain altitudes of 90,000 feet, and have a range of 3,200 nautical miles. The A-11 design was submitted for review. However, due to its relatively large RCS, the A-11 design was rejected. Lockheed was then asked to lower the RCS profile of the A-11, and Convair was tasked with designing a twin-engine aircraft that would have similar performance to the A-11. Interestingly, at this time, both Lockheed and Convair turned to the Pratt & Whitney J-58 as the engine for their designs. The J-58 was originally developed for the Martin P-6M Seamaster, but when the Seamaster aircraft was cancelled, Lockheed and Convair selected the J-58. The reason for this was simple. The J-58 was the most powerful engine available and essentially became a turbo ramjet, meaning it could operate as a conventional afterburning turbojet from takeoff up to about Mach 2, and then, by using permanent compressor bleed to the afterburner, would behave like a ramjet. Lockheed submitted the improved design known now as the A-12, which included the J-58 along with replacing the single tail with twin canted fins and adding non-metallic materials to reduce RCS. Convair took lessons learned from their B-58, F-102, and F-106 designs and submitted the Kingfish. The Kingfish placed both its J-58s in the fuselage and used pyrocream on the leading edges which reduced the RCS even further than the A-12. Although the Kingfish had a theoretically lower RCS, in the end the A-12 was selected for several reasons. Convair's development of the B-58 had proven both lengthy and costly, 
and there were fears that this would occur once again had the Kingfish been allowed to go into production, while Lockheed had produced the U-2 on time and under budget. Another reason was security. In the U-2, Lockheed had demonstrated the ability to keep development of a project secret. Additionally, all the key employees working at the Skunk Works had already received clearance by the CIA. The CIA went with the A-12 project, which took on the codename Oxcart. One of the first challenges for the A-12 was to further reduce its radar cross-section. In the spring of 1959, the Skunk Works crew began building a full-scale mock-up of the A-12 and built a new test facility with a pylon to support the model. In those days, testing of RCS was done by inverting the model, placing it on a pylon, hitting it with radar emissions, and then seeing what the return looked like. After 18 months of testing, an acceptable RCS was achieved for the A-12. One of the most noticeable efforts of the RCS reduction was the Cobra-like appearance of the aircraft. This stemmed from the theory that an airframe which was continuously curved would pose fewer reflective surfaces for radar pulses to track. With the RCS reduction problem solved, the next challenge was performance. The Oxcart aircraft was required to achieve speeds of Mach 3.2, making it faster than a rifle bullet have a range of over 4,000 nautical miles and reach altitudes of up to 97,500 feet. Essentially, the Oxcart aircraft would have to be five times faster and fly three miles higher than its predecessor, the U-2. To achieve these incredible performance figures, the A-12 would have to use hard-to-find materials and in many cases invent new ones. For example, at Mach 3 plus speeds, the J-58 engines needed lubricants that would not break down at extreme temperatures. This led to the invention of synthetic lubricants. Similarly, hydraulic fluids that could handle the high temperatures had to be sourced. To pressurize and move these fluids, a modified hydraulic pump that was being developed for the YB-70 bomber was used. To power the engines, a low vapor pressure fuel had to be used, and the fuel would also act as a heat sink, cooling various parts of the aircraft. Perhaps the biggest challenge was the skin of the airplane. At altitudes and speeds, sections of the A-12 skin could reach 900 degrees Fahrenheit or 482 Celsius. Aluminum at this temperature would melt, and while stainless steel would have worked, the weight penalty was prohibitive. To reach the extreme altitudes it was intended to fly, it was determined that each pound saved added a foot of altitude gained. After investigating many materials, Johnson settled on a titanium alloy known as B-120. B-120 was as strong as stainless steel, but half the weight. However, there were two major problems with B-120. Titanium was incredibly expensive, and there were no suppliers in the United States that could deliver the amount necessary to produce an entire aircraft. In one of the more fascinating Cold War developments, the CIA created various back channels and dummy corporations to purchase large amounts of titanium from the world's leading exporter, the Soviet Union. Effectively, the CIA figured out how to purchase large quantities of titanium from the Soviets and then built an aircraft to spy on them with it. Obtaining the titanium proved to be only half the problem. Titanium is very brittle and as a result difficult to bend, so Lockheed had to devise tools that could be used to work the titanium. Additionally, even with custom tools, in order to achieve the necessary curvature found all over the A-12, Kelly Johnson used triangular shaped pieces of titanium known as fillets. These fillets were glued to the framework of the A-12 by use of a special epoxy resin adhesive. Along with the use of titanium, another weight saving measure was found in the cockpit. At operating speeds, the internal cockpit temperature of the A-12 would be similar to that of a hot oven. To save weight, insulation was not used in the cockpit. Instead, the pilot would wear a pressure suit with its own oxygen supply, cooling system, and pressure control. Construction began on the A-12s, with an initial order of 12 being reduced to 10 due to cost overruns and delays. The Air Force would go on to order additional examples in the form of the YF-12 and M-21, which will be the subject of their own upcoming video. Furthermore, along with delays in manufacturing the airframe, the J-58 engines also ran into issues. In fact, challenges faced in developing the J-58 were so numerous that initial flights with the A-12 would have to be conducted using the less powerful J-75 engines, which were found on the Convair F-106. The J-75 would limit the A-12 to speeds of Mach 1.6 and altitudes of 50,000 feet. 
By 1962, the first A-12 was assembled and tested at Lockheed's Burbank facilities. Since the runway at Burbank was too short and situated near highly populated areas, the decision was made to test the A-12 at the Groom Lake facility, better known today as Area 51. Transporting the A-12 from Burbank to Groom Lake involved using a specially designed trailer that was 35 feet wide and 105 feet long. This journey took two days and involved clearing or modifying roads to accommodate the trailers. Once the aircraft was reassembled and the J-75 engines were installed, a new challenge arose. Since the titanium used in the airframe had to expand at the high temperatures that would be encountered, Lockheed engineers had to allow for gaps or expansion joints in the airframe. When the aircraft was on the ground and subsequently at its lowest temperature, sealants were used to cover the gaps. However, when the aircraft was first fueled up, 68 leaks were found. It turned out that the fuel used by the A-12 would soften the sealants which caused leaks. A sealant which could withstand the fuel's dissolving capabilities was never found, so the A-12 was typically only provided enough fuel to reach a tanker to top off and climb to its operating environment at which point the metal would heat up and close the gap. And finally, in another weight-saving measure, the A-12 had no means of starting itself. To get the engines turning, the AG-330 cart was developed. The AG-330 was nicknamed the Buick as it was powered by two Buick V8 Wildcat engines coupled together. Technicians would later report that it sounded like a stock car race in the hangar when the A-12 was being started. On April 25, 1962, the Ox cart or Article 121 took its unofficial flight with test pilot Louis Schalk at the controls. The aircraft flew at an altitude of 20 feet for about 2 miles. Problems with the controls were encountered and fixed, and on the next day, April 26, the official 40-minute maiden flight took place. During the April 26 flight, some of the triangular fillets came off and had to be reaffixed. Finally, on April 30, 1962, in front of several CIA personnel, the A-12 took to the skies. This flight went to 30,000 feet, reaching speeds of 340 knots, and lasted 59 minutes. Kelly Johnson later remarked that it was the smoothest first test flight of any aircraft he had tested or designed. By January of 1963, Pratt & Whitney had delivered 10 J-58 engines to the testing site. The first flight of an A-12 with two J-58 engines took place on January 15, 1963. Once the A-12s began flying with the J-58s, problems arose at speeds between Mach 2.4 and 2.8. Essentially, the aircraft's own shockwave would interfere with flow into the engine. The solution was to redesign the cone-shaped air inlets and allow them to move forwards or backwards as much as 3 feet to control airflow into the engine. Testing continued and unfortunately there were several crashes. The first crash took place in 1963 when ICE plugged the pitot-static tube and gave erroneous airspeed indications to the pilot, which led to the pilot ejecting. The pilot was uninjured, however the crash occurred near Wendover, Utah. In order to maintain secrecy, a cover story informed the press that the wreckage was that of an F-105. Another crash occurred in 1964 while Article 133 was landing, and a pitch control servo froze, causing the pilot to eject at 129 feet. Once again, the pilot was uninjured, and as the crash took place on base, news did not get out. Finally, in 1965, Article 126 crashed right after takeoff due to an improperly wired stability augmentation system. The pilot ejected safely, and as with the previous crash, word did not get out as the incident occurred on base. With flight testing complete, and before we get into the operational phase, let's look at the camera systems used in the A-12. The A-12 Oxcart initially made use of three camera systems which incorporated photographic innovations never before seen in imaging. The first camera system was the Perkin Elmer Type 1, which was a high ground resolution stereo camera that used an 18 inch lens with 6.6 .6 inch film. The 6.6 .6 inch film was more than four and a half times larger than conventional 35 millimeter film and produced images that covered a 71 mile swath of land with a ground resolution of 12 inches. To capture this large area, a 5,000 foot long roll of film was used. The second camera system was the Eastman Kodak Type 2, another stereo camera system which used a 21 inch lens and 8 inch film. This camera covered a 60 mile swath of land with a ground resolution of 17 inches. This system used an 8,400 foot long roll of film. 
The third camera system, known as the Type 4, was made by Hikon and designed by James Baker. The Type 4 was a spotting camera with extremely high ground resolution. Using a 48-inch lens on 9.5-inch film, a 41-mile wide swath of land with a ground resolution of 8 inches could be captured. To accomplish this, the Type 4 carried 12,000 feet of film. In order to capture the sharpest possible image, a distortion-free, unique type of camera window was designed. Again, with the high speeds and temperature the H12 would operate in, conventional glass would not work. A new distortion-free material would have to be designed, which would be able to withstand exterior temperatures of 550 degrees, along with a 150 degree internal temperature to protect the cameras. An ingenious solution was devised by the Corning Glass Works, which produce a quartz glass window that was fused to the metal frame. Fusing the quartz window to the metal frame involved an unprecedented process which used sound waves. And finally, later in the A12 program, Texas Instruments developed an infrared camera known as the FFD4, which used 3.5 inch film with 150 foot supply. The infrared camera had day or night resolution of 60 feet, along with tolerances of 3 degrees thermally and 1 milliradian spatially. Initially intended to overfly the Soviet Union and eventually Cuba, the infamous 1960 shootdown of a U-2 and the advent of reconnaissance satellites made the use of A-12s over the Soviet Union a risky and emergency-only proposition. Instead of deploying A-12s for reconnaissance that was strategic in nature, the emphasis shifted to a more tactical focus. Most notably, the increasing tensions in North Vietnam at the time led to the formation of Operation Black Shield. A-12s were deployed to Kadena Air Base on Okinawa in May of 1967. In the first Black Shield operation mission, Mel Vajovic flew over North Vietnam at 80,000 feet and a speed of Mach 3.2, photographing SAM sites. The A-12 would then refuel over Thailand and return to Kadena Air Base. For each mission, a primary airplane and a backup aircraft would be readied. Upon returning from its flight, the A-12's film was removed and sent via aircraft to special developing facilities. On early A-12 flights, these were located in Rochester, New York, but later sorties had the film sent to a center in Japan which allowed the Vietnam area commanders a 24-hour turnaround time. When the A-12 began its flights over Vietnam, the primary threat were the SA-2 Guideline Surface-to-Air missiles, which were directed by the Fansong radar. On October 28, 1967, an SA-2 was unsuccessfully launched against an A-12. Photos taken from that mission showed the smoke from the launch site along with pictures of the missile itself and the contrail. Dennis Sullivan, flying an A-12 two days later, noticed that he was being radar tracked on his first photographic pass. On his second pass, at least six missiles were fired and Sullivan actually saw the missiles climb to about 90,000 feet through his rear view periscope. Four of the missiles then tracked towards his A-12, which detonated behind him one which came within 300 feet of his aircraft. Upon post-flight inspection, it was found that debris from the missile had penetrated the lower right wing area and lodged itself against the support structure of the wing tank. While A-12s were overflying Vietnam in 1967, the Soviets were developing a deadlier SAM in the SA-5 Gammon. Experts felt that the SA-5 would pose an even greater risk to the A-12, and as a result, Black Shield missions began to be scaled back. The final Black Shield mission over North Vietnam was flown in March of 1968, which yielded photo reconnaissance of the Laos, Cambodia, and South Vietnam borders. In the end, over 20 Black Shield missions were carried out in support of the Vietnam War. However, this was not the end of Operation Black Shield. In 1968, the Navy intelligence ship Puebla was seized by North Korea. In a tense Cold War standoff, which raised tensions on both sides, one U.S. sailor was killed and the crew was captured and tortured. The Pueblo was hidden by the North Koreans and three A-12 missions were flown over North Korea to locate the ship as well as identify existing defenses and targets for a potential strike. The Pueblo was found in Wonsan Bay guarded by patrol boats and three Kumar-class missile boats. After being held hostage for some 11 months and fears over a nuclear conflict breaking out, the Pueblo's crew were returned to the United States. The Pueblo itself was never returned to the U.S. Navy and is to this day the only commissioned ship on the Navy's roster that is currently being held captive. The North Koreans have turned the Pueblo into a museum on the Pathong River in its capital city. Getting back to the A-12, 
The 29th and final operational mission was flown on May 8, 1968 over North Korea. Next, let's take a look at specifications of the A-12. Length, 101 feet 7 inches. Height, 18 feet 6 inches. Wingspan, 55 feet 7 inches. Maximum takeoff weight, 117,000 pounds. Engines, each Pratt & Whitney J58 produces 20,000 pounds of thrust dry or 32,500 pounds with afterburner. Range, 2,500 nautical miles. Supersonic cruise, Mach 3.1. Maximum speed, estimated to be more than Mach 3.3. Service ceiling, over 85,000 feet. The final A-12 flight was made by Frank Murray on June 21, 1968 to the Palmdale, California storage facility, where all the remaining A-12s were placed in storage for over 20 years. The A-12 had a short operational run, but did lead to the YF-12, M-21, and more famous SR-71, which will be the subject of upcoming videos. The term revolutionary sometimes gets overused in aviation, but the A-12 most certainly was. Kelly Johnson used to say, beautiful planes fly beautifully, and that was most definitely true of the A-12. Built to eclipse its predecessor, the U-2, the A-12 flew higher and faster than anything before it. What do you think? Was the A-12 ahead of its time? Could it find operational use today? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and click the subscribe button and then click on the bell for notifications so you won't miss a video when it comes out. And remember, if you'd like to learn more about the extraordinary pressure suits used in the A-12 program, be sure to check out the video from Uniform History. Stay safe, and see you next time.